Well, good morning. Welcome to C3. We are getting uh, ourselves into week six of our Chasing Epic, and that's what we've been doing, learning about what God has in store for every single one of us. Um, I don't know about you, but uh, I find myself in many situations where I have to move things around for people, like all the time. Uh, it just seems to be a thing. I feel like that's my job half the time here. Um, you guys in this section and this section probably feel that way because every Sunday we ask you to pick up your chairs after we're done with the service. I'm always amazed that you guys even want to say, I always feel like this side's going to be crowded and then this would start to, you know, tether off a little bit and start being a little thinner because you'd be like, I ain't moving no chairs, right? No, but you guys do an amazing job. Those things are up in like five seconds after we end the service. But um, we've been uh, redoing the floors. In the bottom of our house, we do like have like a split level or whatever, so we redid the floors in the bottom half. Well, um, in order for people to come and do that, you have to get things off the ground in order for them to put uh, new flooring on, right? So this whole week has consisted of moving things. That's all I've done. I've had to move uh, the, this couch and this chair. And I mean, not just me, but I've made my family help me, right? The free labor, the three boys that I have to live with me. So make them pick up stuff and move things, right? And move things. You basically go move all this stuff into that room, and then they fix that floor. Then you move all that stuff that you just got out of that room. You bring it to back to that room. Then you also got to move all that stuff from that room into that room, so you can put down the floor in there. Then after you get that one done. Everything has to move over to that side, so then you can get the other room and the hallway and all. And, and then you get to put it all back, right? So I feel like all I've done is lift things, heavy things, awkward things, a whole bunch of stuff, and I had to move it around. I feel like a lot of times we have to move chairs here at church. I do it a lot. We have a group that meets, uh, one of our small groups is uh, my basketball group. A bunch of us get together, we get to play basketball, and it is an awesome time. But we have to move these chairs in order to play. So we have to pick these chairs up. Uh, luckily for me, you guys give me a shortcut and put them up for me on Sundays, and then, but I have to put them back, so we put them back. That's the worst part. We have a blast. We play ball. We have fun, and then we all get to the end. We're like, whoo, that was fun. I'm worn out, and I'm like, yeah, hold on. We got to put these chairs back before you guys can leave. It's literally the worst part of the night, but we're always moving things. I feel like I'm always carrying things. I'm always moving things around, but that's part of it, right? That's part of the gig. Uh, this story that we're actually going to look into this morning is about that exact same thing. There was a guy who was paralyzed, and he wanted to get in front of Jesus, and his friends wanted to get him in front of Jesus. But he had been paralyzed most of his life, so they, they carried him around. He had been paralyzed since birth, so he had always been carried. When he got full grown, then in order to get around, someone had to help him. So his four friends had a mat that he would lay on, and they would pick it up from all four corners, and they would take him all around to be able to move him when they could. And I don't know about you, but um, my, my oldest kid, I've tried to lift him now at 13 years old, and it's getting, I, I don't, it's not good, right? So if, just thinking about trying to pick up a full-grown man all the time and carry him around, it's a tough situation. But that's exactly what we find in this story. And as we've been talking over the past couple weeks, we've been mentioning about our up, in, and out, and the whole point. And, and so we learned uh, last, uh, last couple weeks, here's what we learned about our up. Um, Jesus got up and he went out to an isolated place to pray. Uh, he was moved with compassion. Jesus reached out and touched him. This week we're talking about, then they lowered the man on his mat right down in front of Jesus. We're going to be hitting on that. The next week we're going to talk about the why, which is why does Jesus eat with such scum. So we've been talking about these over the last few weeks, about our ups, our outs, our ins, and our why. And we're going to share today about what it means to look inward and, 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 and to look to those people who are in your group and in your community and around you so that you can actually start showing love and acceptance and hospitality so that you can get those people closer to Jesus. So I want you guys to dive into this story with me this morning. This is in Mark chapter 2. Uh, this is starting right in the beginning of Mark chapter 2. It says, when Jesus returned to Capernaum, several days later, the news spread quickly that he was back home. Soon the house where he was staying was so packed with visitors that there was no more room, even outside the door. While he was preaching God's word to them, four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. They couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, so they dug a hole through the roof above his head. Then they lowered the, mat, the man on his mat right down in front of Jesus. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, My child, your sins are forgiven. So we see in this story that Jesus has gone to this place in Capernaum. And, and, and just to give you a little background here, the, the place where he's at right now was kind of a, a, a hub, a, a central area for a lot of people. There was a lot of things happening in this area. And Jesus 
actually made this, uh, made this kind of his settling place for a little bit. Um, it says that it's his home, but Jesus didn't really have a home. But this was kind of a central area where he would go to often uh, and be with people that he knew. Uh, this was possibly one of his disciples, uh, one of his close friends' house, uh, their parents' house or something. And he would go and stay there and he would be there. So anyways, so he goes to this place and, and, and he's doing his thing. He's eating. He's hanging out with people. He's, he's, he's teaching and, and sharing God's word with other people. And as he always is, when Jesus is found out, when people find out Jesus is close, a crowd emerges, a crowd gathers. So much so that you can't even get into the place. It's, it's jam-packed. You, you, the, you, they're looking in the windows. They're looking through the door. No one could get in and out of this place because it was just jam-packed. Well, lo and behold, while this was happening, uh, there's a guy who's paralyzed and he's on a mat and his four friends are carrying him in. Well, as they're there and they're looking, uh, there's no way for them to get in there. They just can't do it. There's absolutely no way for that to happen. So what they end up doing is they take him up to the roof. Um, now, uh, for you and I, when we're thinking about getting on someone's roof, I mean, you would need a ladder or you would need uh, some other way probably to get someone on the roof of your house, right? Some of you have children, you know that they would find a way to get on the roof of your house, right? But the thing is... Um, it, back in these times, what they would do is a lot of these places had steps that went up to the side of their houses that they built into their houses, and you could actually get onto the roof. The roof was actually just another part of the house. It, it'd be kind of like having, like on, on our house, we have an attached wooden deck that's on our second, the second uh, uh, floor of our house, and then you go up and you can see out above everything, and that's kind of what that area would be sometimes. They would have dinner and, and, and have guests and stuff like that, but sometimes they would put their animals up there. Sometimes they would uh, hang their clothes out to dry there. It, it was just a central area that they used for a lot of different things, but it was easy to access, but you had to climb up. So they were taking their friend up, and when they get to the top, the way that these houses were built, it actually talks about that there were tiles that were taken out. And there's some argument about, what was it a, a stone tile? Basically, they were able to make tiles from the stuff that they had. So they made these things as hard and as cement-like as they could, right? So you have these tiles, and it was made out of a lot of different things. It was made out of mud. It was made out of uh, uh, hair. It was made out of uh, some other things, like some manure and things like that. So, so probably anything that they could get to solidify this thing, they used anything at their disposal. And if you had animals, manure was something that you had a lot of, right? So they would use that to make a lot of those things. So what ends up happening is they actually start to pull back and dig into these tiles and break them up and pull them back as much as they could. And they took their friend and they lowered him down in right in front of Jesus. So all these people, then there's this little spot and they bring him down in front of Jesus, right? So when he gets there, it says in this passage that actually when he's in front of them, that Jesus is so amazed by his friend's faith, by the friends who lowered him down, that they say, he says, your son, son, your sins are are forgiven. And we have this beautiful story. And the story goes on a little bit more. But before we dive into even more of that, there are some things in this story that I think point out to me and to you what it truly means to be inviting, what it truly means to bring people in, what it truly means to love those who are in and around us and how we can show that love. And if we do, it might be just the thing that brings them in front of Jesus. It might just be the thing that shows them the amazing, saving, wonderful, grace-filled power of Jesus in their lives. So I want you to see and, and observe a couple of these things with me, which I think makes up the story. There's a, few, there's a few groups here. It's broken down into a few here, and I want to share those groups with you. The first one is the crowd. The first one is the crowd. Look at what it says right there in the beginning of Mark chapter 2, verse 2. It says, Soon the house where he was staying was so packed with visitors that there was no more room even outside the door. As we see over and over and over with Jesus, when Jesus is doing his thing, when Jesus is making all these things happen, a crowd appears. Now, why does the crowd appear? Why are there so many people? Well, there's a crowd because they're all there to see Jesus, but many of them are there for different reasons, right? Right? So, okay, let's think about some of the groups that would be there. Um, there are people there that uh, are just there because of hearsay. Someone, they were walking past, and they're like, where's everybody going? And they said, there's this dude named Jesus. Have you ever heard about him? He's like, yeah, I've kind of heard people talk. He's doing all this cool stuff. you got to go see. So some people are just curious. 
Some people are just like, what's this about? Let's go check that out. There's something happening. There's other people that heard about his teaching. There's people that heard that he's saying things that no one's ever said before. Things that are so mighty and powerful. The movements are happening. They were like, okay, let's go check that out. I want to hear what he has to say. I've heard from all the rabbis. I've heard from all the priests. I want to hear what this new rabbi has to teach. Maybe I'll learn something I've never heard before. So they're, they're excited about his preaching. There are other people who are coming because they heard about his miracles. They heard about the amazing things that he's already done and the things that he's done for other people. And some of them are just there because they want to see the show. They're like, dude, he may do something crazy. Reminds me of the kid from Incredibles when they're like, what are you waiting for? And he's like, I don't know, something amazing to happen, right? That's what they're waiting. I'm just waiting for something amazing to happen, right? But then there are those people that are there that are sick, that are lame, that are on the outside that have dealt with with infirmities and problems and issues their entire life, and now they're hearing the good news that there's a chance that there's a guy who all he has to do is touch you or talk to you or see you. And all I have to do possibly is reach out to him and touch him. And maybe that will change everything in my life. So they want to go see him. And then there's another group that's there too. You know who that group is? They're the ones that want to get him. They're the ones that are waiting on him to slip up. The ones who are waiting on him to say something so that when they hear it, they can go to the higher ups and say, look what what this dude said. So they're the reporters, right? They're the ones just trying to get all the information. So he's got a lot of people here right now, guys. There is such a huge crowd and people are there for different reasons, but they're all there to hear and see from Jesus, right? And so as this crowd's building up, here come the people with with their their friends, with their friends, friend in, in the mat, and they're like, we can't get near Jesus. There's absolute, there's no way to do this. Well, I don't know what we're going to do, right? Think about the crowds in your life. Think about when we're a part of the crowd, right? Think about what this whole world is about. What are we all trying to figure out? What is the crowd trying to figure out? Why am I here? What is the whole reason for all this? Why was I created? What is this world all about? What is this little blueberry that's floating in the sky? Why are we all here? Like, if you really just think about how small and significant you are, it really just starts to make you wonder, like, what is this all about? And when it comes down to it, what are we all wanting? We are wanting to know our purpose. We're wanting to know our reason. We're wanting to know what this whole mission is supposed to be. Is it that I just, I'm I'm just this clump of cells and and, and I'm just created and then I, I get to be on this earth and breathe for a little while and then I just go down to the ground? Is that it? Like, is that all life is? Some people say yes, that's it. You are absolutely nothing. You are just this this thing, this being that exists for a little bit, and then it's over. So you just enjoy it. There are others that say, hold on, there's more to this life. So people are trying to figure this out. They're trying to see what it is, whether they use science, whether they use religion. They're using all these different ways to try and figure out why they are here. And it makes a crowd. And we're all in that crowd together. But unfortunately, what I believe, and as we see this story... Those crowds and those noises and those distractions and those things that happen in our life can be a barrier in people meeting Jesus. What ends up happening is that these guys aren't able to get to Jesus because of the crowd. What's interesting about the crowds when you read it from the New Testament is it doesn't really put the crowd in a positive light often. Very often when you see the crowd, you see Jesus getting away from the crowd. When there's a big group of people, eventually Jesus is like, this is too much. I got to get out. We, we talked about this not too long ago, just a few weeks ago. We talked about that Jesus often stepped away. He, he, he literally, at some points, everything's going on here and Jesus just gives everybody the slip. And he goes out the back door. And sometimes that's for different reasons. But one of them has to be because of the crowd. Many times Jesus did not view the crowd in a positive way. And so too often what we want to do is we want to go to the crowd. Let's be honest, we all like a crowd. Listen, there's nothing like coming on a, on a Sunday and you're preaching and there's a whole bunch of people there. You're like, all right, it's going to be a good morning, right? A lot of people there, all right? Until you all are like, that was the worst message I've ever heard in my life, right? And you're like, maybe there should have been a little less people there, right? But think about it. We all like a crowd, right? You guys go to a sporting event. Man, isn't it so much better when there's a lot of people there and everybody's 
screaming and cheering. Man, there's so you go to a good concert, man, and, and the, 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 the arena is filled, and everybody's got their lights up, and everybody's singing along. Dude, the crowd is awesome. It's so much fun. It, it gives you this feeling of excitement and, and inclusion because everybody is there with us, but everybody may have different reasons for being there, but everybody's together. Listen, there are churches all across America right now that have a bunch of people in them. Some of them are small little pockets of churches. Some places have huge amounts of people in them right now, right? And there are people everywhere. Why? Because we are attracted often to a crowd. We are attracted to a huge group of people. But Jesus many times found himself saying, let's, and that's all fine and dandy. But the crowd can be a barrier sometimes. Sometimes we can get in a place where we have to watch out for the crowd. The noises, the distractions, the chaos that surrounds us in our life. What are the crowd noises in your life? Listen, there's, the, you know what's, I, I love football, but specifically college football. You want to know why? Because you ain't going to get nowhere else where you got to go into an arena and that place is literally shaking from the amount of fans. I mean, you watch some of those places. Like you go to Penn State when they do their wide out. Or, or, or you go, like, man, you go, you ever seen, like, the Virginia Tech team come out to enter Sandman? It's one of the most amazing things. Look it up on YouTube. Uh, uh, the Virginia Tech football team coming out to enter Sandman. It is wild. It is loud. It is crazy. The stuff is intense. Why? Because the crowd is big and it has an influence, right? It means something. Think about this. But what's the whole point of doing that? It's to rattle the away team. It's to make them go, I can't even call out the cadence. You can't, hey, everybody calm down. I can't hear anything. Why? That's the whole point because it zones, it zones us out and we're unable to get those. What are the noises and the distractions and the crowds that are keeping you and keeping others from Jesus? He recognized the crowd. The friends recognized the crowd and knew that they had to do something. So you have the crowd. And then the next group I think you see is the row. Now, I know you're saying, well, there's no, they're not like standing in a row. What do you mean? So think about this for you and I. What do we do? When we go to a building, when we go to a place like this, what, how, how do we sit? In rows, right? We set up rows. I talked about moving chairs. The worst thing we have to do is make sure, okay, how many chairs is in this row? Is this angled correctly? Okay, it's seven of seven. And do we have enough there? And, and you just got to calculate and make sure you have it all right. Right. Why? Because you want the rows to look nice. Everybody sits in a row, right? You may have grown up in a church where it was pews, right? And you always had the whole straight pew, and everybody sits in a row, right? But that's a good group. You always like, who, you guys come in, you're like, listen, you sit with me. This is, our, this is our row. This is our pew. This is our area, right? This is our place to be, right? And I'm going to sit my people with me, or I'm going to sit my friends with me, or I'm going to sit my group with me. Why? Because you want to sit with them. Because they're your friends. They're your loved ones. They're your family. They're the people that you care about, Right? We sit with those people. That's exactly what we see here. We see these people who are understanding this. Look at what it says in the second part of verse 2. While he was preaching God's word to them, four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. Right here, away from the crowd, we have this paralyzed man who has a group of friends who carried him to Jesus. He had a group. He had a crew of people. I want you to know how important it is that we understand that we have those people in our life, that we are understanding what that means. Listen, this is a cool thing that we get to do. This is a cool opportunity that we have. There are many places in the world today, right now, in this very moment, they might be doing what we're doing, but they have to do it in a bunker. They have to do it in a basement. They have to do it in a cave. They have to do it hidden from everyone else. But we get to actually come here and do this together. We get to open up the doors. We get to turn on the lights. We get to boom the music. We get to have a party. We get to have a celebration because of who of Jesus is. And we get to proclaim it boldly without fear of being rejected or without fear of being arrested. We get that opportunity here. It's awesome. It's really good. I want you to know how, listen, I love, I love being able to do this. And I enjoy being able to brag a little bit on what we're able to do here, right? Listen, we get the opportunity to sing together. We get the opportunity to worship. We get to do it through our songs. We get to do it through studying and learning God's Word and giving a word of encouragement and understanding the good news of Jesus. We get to do that every Sunday morning. We get to do it twice, two times every Sunday morning, right? And guess what? While that's happening, while you guys get to chill here and you get to listen, you get to enjoy and you get to learn and you get to be encouraged and challenged, guess what? Same thing's happening right across the hallway here. 
We have kids who get to go in there and they're learning about Jesus. They're understanding how much God loves them. They get to sing songs. They get to play games. They get to get rowdy. They get to have fun because they're kids, right? They get to do those things. And guess what? We, we also get to do those things. We also come back on Sunday nights. I have teenagers who come here every Sunday night and I have adults who build into them and get to know them and help them learn and understand how much God loves them and has a purpose and a reason for their life. Because that's what it comes down to. We're not called just to sit there, but we're actually called to move. And we get to do that. Listen, I love it. I absolutely love that I get to build into teens and teenagers. Why? Not just because my kids are there. It was way before them. It's exactly what God wants me to do with my life. That's something that's awesome. We get to do that every single week. It's important that we understand how crucial the row is for us. It's good. It's great. I hope you guys enjoy coming here every week. I hope you guys enjoy being a part of this. But it goes even deeper than that. It goes way deeper than we could ever imagine. But in order for us to be able to learn from that, we have to make sure and we understand that as we come to this building and as we do outreaches and as we we sing songs, as we do all these things, understanding and learning and comprehending the good news of what Jesus has done for us and that he has done for others so that we can show them how much God loves them. We get to do that together here. That's something to appreciate. That's something to not take for granted because it is an amazing opportunity. But it doesn't just end there. Once you have your crowd and you get a little further into the row, now you're talking about the circle. What's the circle? The circle is those people around who are able to carry those burdens for me and those people who are able to carry those burdens for you. Look at what it says here in verse 4. They couldn't bring Jesus because of the crowd, bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, so they dug a hole through the roof above his head. Then they lowered the man on his mat right down in front of Jesus. Now, try and get, try and, let's try our best to get into this situation, all right? So, you have the group, Jesus is doing his thing, he's teaching, preaching God's word, telling them about the good news, about what God has done for them now, right? And, and all of a sudden, as Jesus is doing his thing, they hear a little rustling, right? They hear some, they hear some scratches, they hear, they're like, telling the disciple, whoever's house it is, you might have some pests, you might want to look on that, right? So, they hear a little more. Anyways, they just get back to it. Then eventually, a little light breaks through the top, and now they got like pieces of Dirt and stuff falling on their head. Now, you remember what I told you they, they used for that stuff, right? So that's falling down on them. They're like, what in the world, right? So I'm trying to also look at this from the, from the, the side of the, the, the guy on the mat, right? So his friends are carrying him around, okay? And he probably sees the crowd and he's like, well, guys, I don't know. You know what? How about we just, maybe just sit here and we'll wait. Maybe the crowd will die down before he leaves and we can, we can get to him before. And they say, nope, we're taking you up. We're taking you through the roof. And he has no choice, right? I mean, he can't walk. So he's like, I don't know if this is the time or place for this, guys. I just think this might not go well for him. They're like, mm-mm, we're, taking, we're getting you to Jesus, right? So they carry him up. And the whole time he's like, guys, seriously, it's fine. We don't have to do this, okay? But they take him all the way up there. And they start digging into this. And a pastor once said this about digging down. Because they had to go through those tiles to get to Jesus. And I want you to see how important this is. They used all this material, dirt, hair, all this used products. They used manure and all this stuff. A pastor once said that in order to be able to get people to Jesus, sometimes you're going to have to dig through a lot of crap. In order to get people in front of Jesus, you're going to deal with some messiness in your life. The people who are in and around you and that you want to invite in, sometimes it's going to get messy. Sometimes it's going to get dirty. And sometimes you're going to get frustrated. Sometimes you're not going to understand it. And sometimes you're going to wonder if it's even worth it. But there's something to having a determination to get your people, those people around you, to Jesus, to see something miraculous happen. And so they're digging, they're digging, they're digging. And I don't know if they got to the point where it was long enough to where they could just lower him, like, you know, like on all, like on all four corners of the mat, or if they just like got it to the point where it was like his head could stick in. Like, have you ever thought about that? I think about this all the time. This is the weird stuff I think about. Like, did they lower him in feet first? Like, did he go in head first? Like, and think about the awkwardness. So they just ripped open this dude's roof, whoever lives there, right? So they're probably, I don't know about you, but if someone came to my house and they ripped open my roof and they were like, hey, the front door was locked, just thought I'd stop in, right? I'd be like, knock, you idiot. What are you doing? 
Like, why would you do that, right? I would be mad. So you got people who are mad. You got people who are confused. You got all this, and it's just awkward at this point. And so here they are. They just ripped open this roof, and here comes the dude just down like slowly. And everyone's just staring at him. Everyone's just looking at him like, what in the world is happening? And he's like, hey. Like, I mean, it's just this weird, awkward moment. And they're lowering him down, and they're bringing him in front of Jesus, right? Why is this? Listen, it's weird. It's awkward. It's tough. It's messy. It's all these different things. But that was able to occur because they, he had friends that were determined that they were going to do everything within their power, even when it was hard, even when it was awkward, even when it was weird, even when it was tough, even when it was messy, that they were going to make sure that they had an encounter with Jesus. You and I too often, what we want to do is we want to have an encounter with Jesus. We want to make sure that we're having it. But too often we tell people, you can be a part of this, but I'm not going to make any effort to make sure you find Jesus. All right? I'm going to make sure you're the one. Listen, I'll invite you to church. You can come be a part of it. That's fine. But don't come to my house. (laughs) Don't sit at my table. All right? Please just leave it to you. That's what we want to do. That's how we treat most people. Unless we let them in, that's where we want to leave people. But that's not what God has called us to do. He tells us that we need to be able. If you want to look at it better, it's more or less a circle than it is a you. Because we want to open up that circle and we want to bring people and tell people all the time, hey, right here, come on in. Everyone is invited to the party. Everyone is invited to Jesus. Everyone is a part of of what God can do in their life. People are always invited to the circle. There was a lady, um, this was a, a while back, early 2000s, late 90s, there was a, a movement of, of a big conference thing that they had for men back in uh, uh, the 90s, and um, it was all, going all across America. And uh, there was this, um, th- someone sent, sent this video of this guy telling this in a podcast to me, and so I just thought I'd share. And the lady, um, what, just a seething review of this thing. She was not a Christian. She thought Christianity was bigoted, closed-minded. She didn't want anything to do with it. So much so that she wrote this big article about it and put it out in the paper, basically saying, you do not want this in our town. These people should not be here, all this stuff, right? So she got mail back. Um, She got people saying, I agree. I think that's great. I think you're right. Religion should stay out, you know, all this stuff. Then you have other people, and they said, she got some hate mail. And some of them being people who were Christians, who were telling her she was going to hell and you're, you know, and I can't believe you would say that and you have no, you know, all this stuff, right? She got one letter uh, from a pastor and as she read it, she had a, so all the letters she got, she put the, the good mail and the bad mail. So every good review somebody had of her story, she put here. Of the bad review she put over here, right? This one, she had no clue which one to put it in. Because as she read it, This guy couldn't have disagreed with her more. But the way that he spoke to her was with so much respect and with so much humility and so much love and acceptance that she was was flabbergasted. She didn't know what to do with it. So she leaves it on her desk a couple weeks. Then she just kept going back to it in her head. So she decided, you know what? Had the contact information. I'm going to call her. So calls, says, hey, I'd like to do an interview with you. All right, fine. Come on in. So they they set up a time. Well, she goes down there, right? And she's ready for a battle. She's ready for a debate. She's ready to go at this dude. She's got all of her questions ready, and she's just ready to go at this dude. But as she goes into the house, she is floored because as she starts to come into this house and be a part of this, she said the house was like a revolving door. The amount of people who came in and out as, she invi- as they invited people into their home and showed love and acceptance to everyone who was a part of it. She said she had never felt so loved. She had never felt so accepted from someone who had a completely different view on life. She didn't know what to do. But you know what it did? She had an encounter with Jesus. And it changed her life. She's a Christian now. And that happened because she says the one thing that Christianity can show to change people and to move people is showing love and inviting people in to people who are different than them. People who maybe don't have the same exact view as you. Listen, I want you to know that these guys probably still had questions about Jesus. They weren't exactly sure what he was all about. But they knew that if they got him in front of Jesus, something miraculous can and will happen. 
You know, for us, we find ourselves in places where we're like, that person's never, that person's never going to have a relationship with Jesus. That person's never going to want to be a part of this. I actually don't even like that person, so I'd rather them not be a part of this thing. We don't want to bring people in. We want to make sure that we just have our little group and our little huddle, and we want to make sure that we're comfortable. But Jesus calls us to more than that. We understand that we are able to show love and hospitality and grace and mercy to other people, even those that we don't agree with, even those that we have opposing views from. It's important for us to remember that. So we have the, uh, we have the crowd, we have the row, we have the circle. And the last one I think is important, the chair. One chair. You, me, that's, you get one chair for each and every person. You see, when it comes down to it and all these different groups and all these things, what makes it all occur? Once we find ourselves deeper and deeper, now we get that one-on-one encounter with Jesus. Now we find ourselves in front of the one who loves us. Now we find ourselves in front of the one who cares and reaches out to us and wants to change us. The one who wants to give us a full free, abundant life. We now have an encounter with him. All of these things that are happening, I promise you right now, all of these people that are there listening to Jesus, all of the the occurrence of ripping open the roof and and lowering them down and this feeling of just guilt and shame and embarrassment and, and awkwardness and all those things that are happening as he is in front of Jesus, I'm sure that in this moment, Jesus is just glowing and smiling from ear to ear as he is amazed by the faith of the friends that would go through all of these lengths to put him in front of him. And it says that as Jesus is amazed and that he is uh, uh, just flabbergasted by this, in verse 5 it says, Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, My child, your sins are forgiven. Through the help and determination of his friends, this guy who thought he was just coming for a healing, who was just hoping that maybe this guy would help him out a little bit, he was able to see for the first time his greatest need. And that was salvation. And that was the fact that he could give his life and find out that it is free and that there's nothing he could do to have that. Could you find someone more helpless in this moment? Could you find someone who had no other option? Could you find someone else who, who, who would better fit the ticket than this guy who was utterly alone and helpless in this moment? And there's Jesus just smiling and looking at his friends. And he says, your sins are forgiven. I want you to know that this morning, that even though we may be a part of the crowd, even though you may be in the row, maybe those people who are watching online, you're in that row with your friends and your loved ones right now. You're in that row of the people watching right now. Maybe you find yourself in that circle. Maybe you do have that close group. Maybe you do have those people that you can go to because you need that. You need those people in your life and you need to bring those people into your life. You have those. Why do we do it? Because it is wonderful that God can deal with us on an individual basis. Because my situation is not the same as yours. Your situation is not the same as mine. God created you. He created you with a purpose, and He created you for a meaning. And C3 wants you to know that our purpose is to help you find your purpose. It's yours. It's yours and God's alone. It's that relationship that you find with Him. That's why Jesus got alone with God. That's why Jesus went away from the crowd. He did it because He wanted to sit at the chair with His Father. I want you to know more than anything this morning, I want you to know that your greatest need is not for that family situation to get better. Your greatest need is not for uh, to have more money. Your greatest need is not to make sure that all your relationships are where it's supposed to be. If we really want to get down to it, our greatest need is knowing that God loves you so much, so, so much, that He gave His Son for you. So that you could understand that he has a purpose for you. Now, that doesn't mean everything's going to go great in your life. That doesn't mean that that's going to solve all those problems. You see, because this is what we do. We think that that's going to make it happen, but that's not what it is. Now, if you're like me, when you read that, you say, okay, this guy wanted a healing, and Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. Why? Why didn't you just say, you're healed? Why do you say sins are forgiven? Why, why would that happen? Look at what here happens in the story. Verse 6, 
But some of the teachers of the religious law who were sitting there thought of themselves, what is he saying? This is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. There's the dudes who are trying to get him. Those were the dudes. They just think, you're, you're got. We got you. That's who we want. You said what we need you to say. Look at this. Jesus knew immediately what they were thinking. So he asked them, why do you question this in your hearts? Is it easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or stand up, pick up your mat, and walk? So I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. And the man jumped up, grabbed his mat, and walked out through the stunned onlookers. They were all amazed and praised God, exclaiming, we have never seen anything like this before. Interestingly enough, this paralyzed man nor his friends knew what the outcome was going to be. They didn't even know if anything was going to happen, but they were determined to get him in front of Jesus. And when they got him in front of Jesus, he realized his greatest need, and that was the forgiveness that only God can provide. And so what happens? They get, they're like, ooh, he just said, Forgive sins, only God can forgive sins. He's calling himself God, blasphemy, boom, got him. We're going to get this dude, right? And Jesus hears him, and he says a question. Which is easier? What's easier? Your sins are forgiven, or rise up, take your mat? Which one's easier? And so my question to you guys, which is easier? For a miracle to occur and someone who was sick is no longer sick. For someone who was blind and now they can see. For someone who was lame and now they can walk. Which is easier? Or is it for someone to have their sins forgiven? This was the question that Jesus had for all those religious teachers. Those guys who knew everything about God. Those who knew all the rules and all the things that they had to say. We have a group of ladies. And this is my last story. Then we're done. I promise. We have a group of ladies who meets every Tuesday with some... some people who are in need, and, and, and they sit down, and they talk, and they eat. They share with each other, right? And as they were talking this week, I, I was laughing. The, they, they would tell you the story way better than I would, okay? But they're talking with them, and, and it got into a theological. I don't know if you've ever ran into this. You're just trying to be nice and share Jesus. Jesus loves you. And then they say, well, what about transubstantiation? You're like, whoa, 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 hold on. Well, I don't even know how to spell that word, right? It's like, why are you using all these funny words, right? So they start talking, and they're like, oh, now what do you think about heaven? What do you think about hell? And, 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 and now, now what happens to you? And, 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 and a lot of different just deep theological ideas. And they're like, I don't, I don't, you know. They start arguing. That's what's funny. They start arguing with each other. They're like, well, I think this. Well, I don't agree with that. So it's not arguing. It's just talking. And they've all got all this stuff going on, right? Well, all this is happening. You're thinking to yourself, man, are we just spinning our rims? Are we just wasting our time? What's the whole point of all this? What's the reason for this happening? Well, one of the ladies that comes to it started talking to one of our other girls. And she was sitting behind him, and they started talking about how she dealt with some prison time and, and just some other things and had a strained relationship with her daughter and was just really hurting. Didn't know how she was going to be able to deal with this, right? And she said, I just feel so much shame and guilt for how I've lived my life and how I've ruined my life and I've ruined my kid's life, and I just don't know if I can ever forgive myself and quit feeling the guilt that I feel. My daughters say they can forgive me, but I don't know how or why they would. She asked her, would you forgive your kids? Would you forgive those people? And how much do you love your kids? You'd do anything for them, right? She reminded her that God loved her so much and forgive her. Just like Jesus told this man, son, your sins are forgiven. The most important thing, the greatest need that we have is understanding that at the end of the day, no matter how many times we mess this up, no matter, matter how many times we keep trying, we keep trying, we keep failing, no matter how many times we are encouraged, but then we're put right back down, no matter how many times we think we have the answers, but then we get more questions added on top of that, no matter how many times that happened, if we can all just be reminded and remember that we are forgiven and we are loved and we are chosen and we are given this full free life by God. That's when we understand the good news. I want you to know more than anything this morning. If you didn't hear anything else, I want you to know this morning that God has something amazing in store for you. 
And in order to have that, all you have to do is trust him. All you have to do is give your life to him. All you have to do is speak to him. The Bible says that those who call upon God will be saved. And if we just repent, if we just change our mind, if we stop thinking this way about God, and we start looking at God the way that Jesus wants us to look at God, then we can see a change. And when it starts from that chair, guess what happens? It grows to your, goes to your, your row, goes to your circle, it goes to your, your crowd, and you start to see an amazing change. So this morning as I close, would you guys just bow your heads really quick and we're going to Call it quits. I appreciate you guys listening. I want you to know that there's anyone here who needs that good news, who needs to know, listen, leave the, I want you to leave this place knowing the good news of Jesus. I don't care where you're at. If you're having a problem forgiving yourself, if you're having a problem with relationships or, or, or strife or, or sickness in your life, whatever it is, I want you to know that you can have an encounter with Jesus. All you have to do is call on him. If you need to speak to him, you can do it right now. If you're watching online and need to speak to him, you can do it right now. All you have to do is talk to him. You can say, God, I know that I don't do this thing right. I know that I'm not perfect, but I know that you gave your son Jesus so that I could have a way to be with you. I'm sorry for the things I've done wrong. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus, to die for me. I want to live my life for you. This morning, the rest of us who know Jesus and are still figuring this thing out together, I want you to know this morning, your challenge is simple. Share a meal with someone. Be with someone in your life and present them and show them to Jesus. Pray for him. Encourage him. If you're like, that's not me, I got an easy A for you. Come back tonight, 5.30. We share a meal together every Sunday night. We would love for you to be here. Bring your family. Father, we do thank you for this time. We thank you for reminding us, God, that with, with good friends, we're, we're able to find ourselves in a place. God, I pray for those who are searching for friends. I pray for those who are in need of friends, God, that we would be open and inviting. I pray that we would understand what that means to invite others. Because, God, you have something in store for so many of us. We just have to be able to present ourselves to you so that we can present you to others. We love you so much this morning. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Guys, we hope you have an amazing, amazing week. Middle and my left row, would you please help me? And we're going to stack up some chairs for tonight. 5.30 hangout tonight. We hope you guys can come back. Have a great week. God bless.